Welcome to Culinary Arts. The uh, levels, the pins that you see, we don't have a one for level one, which we're doing level one right now is the book learning part. Level two and three would be the more important part, uh, but it's important that you know your terminology as well. Uh, so two and three are from a uh, physical hands-on class, which we have a chef to do. And based on how well you do in that class, you would get uh, at the uh, chef's discretion level two or level three. So we're doing level one just to make sure that everybody's on a level playing field. Um, with the terminology, not everybody knows what a salamander is, what a mandolin is, uh, broiling, baking, sauteing. So we're just m acting like nobody knows nothing and just going through to get everybody in a level p playing field, get you a certification, moves you up towards a uh, professional chef and uh, professional in general and leads towards a Master Certified Food and Beverage Director, which is the ultimate certification that we have, and it would include uh, everybody would have to do at least this lecture. So CCP1 is uh, owned by the Global Food Service Institute at the State University of New York at Morrisville. Training, this part is presented by myself, Ed Manley, and then I have uh, chefs to do the other part. That part I can't, I can't do, not a chef. And we work in cooperation with Pearson Learning Solutions, which is the world's largest provider of uh, workforce development. So welcome to the course again. So this course is going to take you through the test questions, uh, basically, on the uh, Certified Culinary Professional Examination. And it's not intended to make you the world's leading chef. It's not intended to make you the chef at the Hyatt. It is intended to make you better than wor you were yesterday to give you the basic knowledge of the uh, terminology. So if the chef sends you to the back to get a uh, mandolin, you don't show up with a musical uh, uh, instrument, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. So not everybody knows that, so I'm going to assume you don't. Uh, some people who are taking this are, you know, highly qualified chefs that have been around a long time, and for all this stuff, you're going to go, uh, yeah, duh, uh, and that's fine. Um, the same thing, you know, when a American, uh, when a Spanish person takes uh, Spanish, because they just need three credits. <laughs> you know, so, uh, anyway, uh, let's start with uh, terminology, because uh, that's uh, important that you know. So, uh, becoming a professional chef requires skill, dedication, and professional pride. So that would be a test question. So easy enough, but we just want to make sure that everybody knows uh, what does it take to be a chef. You got to be skilled, obviously and you got to be dedicated because it's not easy and professional pride in uh, what you produce. What is the sous chef? That's the cook who supervises food production, reports to the executive chef. He or she is second in command of the kitchen and usually uh, is the one who actually runs the place on a day-to-day -day basis. It's important that you pronounce these all properly and so I've uh, again some people, most of you would know this, but not everybody does, so I'm trying to get everybody on a level playing field. So I've spelled them out um, phonetically. So Gardemanger is the cook in charge of the cold food productions, also referred to as the pantry chef. The expediter, the person in the kitchen who keeps the flow going, inspects the pans and the plates as they leave the kitchen to see that they have the correct items customer ordered, are properly garnished, have no gravy slapped on the edge of the plate, and the entire plate looks like it should. So they're the final word before the product goes out to the customer to make sure it matches the photos that you took of them uh, when you set all this up and to make sure that it uh, hits the standards of the operation. That's called the expediter. Blanching versus power boiling. The major difference is that blanching requires a shorter cooking time than power boiling. The dry heat cooking methods. Cooking by dry heat is the process of applying heat either directly by subjecting the food to the heat of a flame or indirectly by surrounding the food with heated air or heated fat. Broiling would be an example. It uses radiant heat from an overhead source to cook the foods. Grilling uses a heat source located beneath the cooking surface. The grilling is red might be because it's a test question. Deep frying, same thing. 
and it uses conduction and convection to transfer heat to food submerged in hot fat. Roasting or baking uses a process of surrounding the food with dry heated air in a closed environment. And sautéing uses conduction to transfer heat from a hot sauté pan to food with the aid of a small amount of fat. Pan frying is a dry heat cooking method that uses conduction to transfer heat to a food resting directly on the cooking surface. The most accurate way to determine doneness is the appearance or color should be well browned on each side. Braising is a combination cooking method in which foods are first browned in hot fat, then covered and slowly cooked in a small amount of liquid over low heat. Beef pot roast is an example of when braising should be used. So the test question would be, what's an example of a product that you would um, use braising for? It would be beef pot roast, or it might say uh, beef pot roast, the best way to cook it would be braising and some other choices. So beef pot roast braising. Broiling is a dry heat cooking method in which foods are cooked by heat radiating from an overhead source. Broiling is suitable for most tender cuts of beef, meat, and we call that thing a salamander when you use it to uh, top brown so you put foods in it, you put some cheese or something on top and put it into the salamander for a minute to brown it off. And that's a uh, heavily used uh, item. Simmering is a moist heat cooking method that uses convection to transfer heat from a hot liquid to the food submerged in it. Simmering adds flavor from the cooking oil, makes the meat more tender, extracts the curing salt or brine. So the test question would be kind of all of that stuff. It would say, what does simmering do, probably? Or it might say, what adds flavor from cooking oil, blah, blah. And the answer would be simmering. Could be either way on that question. Blending is the mixing of two or more ingredients until they're evenly distributed. Equipment used can range from a spoon to an electric mixer fitted with a paddle. Immersion blenders or hand blenders are great for chopping, pureeing, and emulsifying. Flavor is the distinctive quality of a food or drink perceived with the combined senses of taste, touch, and smell. So flavor we think of as taste, but it's also touch and smell. The bouquet garni is a selection of herbs and vegetables that are tied into a bundle with twine, and then you drop them in the soup or sauce. Useful for introducing flavoring, seasonings, and aromatics into stocks, sauces, soups, and stews. The standard bouquet consists of parsley stems, celery, thyme, leeks, and carrots. I think there's a test question about that or what's not in a bouquet garni. So remember, parsley stems, celery, thyme, leeks, and carrots are in a bouquet garni. To make a white roux with 8 ounces of clarified butter, you will need how much flour or cornstarch? Eight ounces of flour, so eight ounces of butter and equal ounces of flour. Simple carbohydrates are naturally occurring sugars such as glucose and fructose. They taste, look, and smell and react the same as complex carbohydrates.